Hi everybody, welcome back to the SICE Transport Division's video series, 20 Minutes with a Transport Professional. I am Erin Silva, Head of Student Outreach. Today we are joined by Robin Chetty, who is a Public Transport Planner from the Etekweni Metropolitan Municipality in KZN. Robin, thank you so much for taking the time to actually talk to with us today. As a start, can you please provide us with a background of your career in public transport planning? Uh, thank you so much, Erin. It's a joy and a privilege to be with you live today and uh, actually to do this interview. I'm really honored to put that you chose me to be part of it. So um, I, pr I hope that I actually uh, answer the questions correctly and provide good, meaningful uh, information to all our years. So welcome, everybody. It's glad to, I'm so glad that you connected with us. And yeah, so my journey actually started that I'm a civil engineer by profession. Um, I actually specialize in roads and storm water design. And then I went on and did a postgrad in, um, in transport, but I was still in the uh, design sector. And so in 20, 2002, I joined the traffic engineering um, branch of the Etigweni municipality. And then in 2008, I was offered the position of senior manager public transport planning. And the truth be told, I had no idea, no clue what it was. And so, yeah, so I was called in, I was interviewed and I just went like normal, just go for an interview. And the next minute I was told I got the job and I started. And my first task was uh, my then um, so a deputy head was Logan Moodley, he's since retired. And he said to me, Robin, you are now the public transport specialist and uh, in all cities need to develop a an integrated uh, it was called the IRPT, an Integrated Rapid Public Transport Network. I had no clue what the, the acronym meant. All I was thrown was the Public Transport Action Plan, and it said cities need to develop a uh, integrated rapid public transport network. And so that's where my career started, Erin, and it started 13 years ago. And uh, just to tell you that it took me one solid year to develop the terms of reference, but I'm so excited because whatever was contained and the way we, we conceptualized it, both Logan and myself, and we had input, by the way, from your company, um, a gentleman by the name of um, John Simmons. And so for an entire year, the three of us just grappled with this. We kind of wrestled with it. Uh, at that stage, only um, Ria Via was beginning to happen because that became the legacy project for the World Cup, 2010 World Cup. So there was really very little information out there. And so being a pucker, roads engineer coming into the public transport domain, I had no clue, but it was such a joy and working with two fantastic men with great experience. We were able to develop this uh, um, term of reference. And when I look at what we've done today, every single detail, we actually conceptualized it then. I'm so excited that we've never left out a single part of what happened. So that's where my journey started in terms of public transport planning. Robin, that's fantastic. You've sort of brought about, you know, this big difference in between varsity, because I mean, I think that graduates come into uh, industry and they sort of like have no idea what's going on. And I think it's just so poignant that you as a professional engineer got put into a completely new role and, you know, it stretched you and you were forced to, you know, be agile and take it on. And the stuff that the Etiquity uh, Metropolitan Municipality has achieved is something, nothing actually short of remarkable. So it's absolutely huge. So you've spoken a bit of what your journey was like, but can you explain to us what entails being a public transport planner? Well, I mean, I think that's an interesting question because when I came in, I promise you I had no clue. There was very little literature that I could find, as well as university and, and studying. You know, it's like I I think we very little was taught um, at tertiary level regarding how do you actually go about doing a public transport plan? I'm serious. I mean, I look for textbooks. I looked for other examples and I didn't find it. And so then really, like, I think the, the thing was about really understanding. So what am I supposed to do? And I'll never forget. Um, I only had two staff members. I had a GIS technician and I had a civil engineering technician. So he was as green as I. And we were asked to do a public transfer plan for a greenfields development, which is up north. And um, so eventually we started grappling with things and we didn't understand it. And so we, we started to just use kind of logic, you know, um, what do we need to do? We started figuring out 
you know, origin and destination where people are going and, and how do we begin to take on this journey? And, and I must be honest that, you know, by just being very simple, understanding the problem, you got a true box, and we were able to actually do a public transport plan. And, you know, if I, if I show you the first one, and so as I said to you, my, my, my senior was Logan Moodley, and he asked me for this to develop a public transport plan, which needed to have a, a service plan in terms of uh, what the service is going to be like and you know what mode we're going to use the frequencies and then together with that we needed to also uh come up with the facilities you know whether you need a rank you need a holding facility whatever we just took a big step of faith and and kind of did it you know with the knowledge just like whatever we got and today when i look back 13 years ago and so when i share that with, with logan i mean he was quite impressed with how it was so good and when i look back i mean I, it's like it was such a fantastic journey because it really just started evolving as we're going along. And what I love about public transport planning is that every single day it's different. Uh, you know, it's, it's although it's public transport, like it's also dealing with right now, we have an issue with e-hailing, metered taxis, you know, over the, um, over the pandemic uh, in Durban alone, uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had like about 600, say six, 700 uh, e-hailing metered taxi services in Durban. Um, during COVID, that number shot up to over 10,000, 11,000 in terms of, you know, uh, e-hailing services, metered taxis, because people found a new uh, sort of, you know, they're looking for, for employment. I got a car. I need to make money. People don't want to get into a public transport system. So really, you know, and, and there's, there's no literature. No one's got that. How do you actually regulate the system, what you do? And so we're so excited and I hope we have another uh, time like this and I can actually share it, uh, you know, like what we've done. So. As I said to you that, um, you know, it's, it's really been a fantastic journey because we started learning along the way. Um, you know, it's about understanding the industry and really starting to work with them. And what I find so important was a lot of times you actually do a desktop study, you know, quickly want to jump into a survey. I get the information. I want to analyze information, understand, you know, the destinations, um, the number of vehicles, where they're operating, where they're going, journey times and all those kind of things. But I found that just, you know, also interacting with the industry, you actually learn so much and you learn like how to do the business better and you know become more proficient in what we did so again as i said that i haven't arrived um it's 13 years later i haven't arrived and i'm still learning along the way but i find it's such a dynamic such an exciting um it's a complex sort of um sort of um, sector of civil engineering but i know that every day we're getting better and better so I think you've summed it up pretty well is that public transport planning is not simply just the municipality. It's this conglomeration of minds uh, coming together to try and solve a, an issue that really does plague this country. And I just like how you said you've got this toolbox. Uh, and I think that's really, you know, our graduates need to hear that, that they've got all the tools that they need to do it. It's just understanding of which tools go together in order to actually create the solutions that you have done. Yep. So, and also another thing that kind of stuck out for me of what you said was, you know, use your, your engineering judgment. You know, we didn't have the literature or, or all the answers. It was merely going through it and how it evolved and how you just use uh, that toolbox in the necessary ways. So you've spoken to us about, you know, how it's diverse. You've got to be agile and adaptable and that. But what are the principles of public transport planning? You know, before I answer the question, I think that, you know, I'm speaking to graduates here and uh, I, t I love empowering young people. And so my team is quite young and I was just saying to them last night, in fact, we were trying to, uh, we're dealing with a public transport matter for a massive uh, development coming on board and they've got no land. There's actually no land for any facility and we're kind of trying to find a solution. And I said to them, you know, I think what, what, what learning institutions do is that firstly, they teach you how to identify the problem. So whether you are at, at, at a university of technology or a university, when you go for lectures, they are teaching you how to define the problem, how to determine the problem. The second thing is then they give you a whole toolbox, you know, all the different solutions. So I liken it like this, like you've got a problem uh, with water at home 
and you come home and you call the plumber. When he comes, he, all he comes in is with a toolbox. And you say, no, no, my tap is leaking. So he comes in, looks at it, and then you notice he opens his toolbox. He take the first spanner, he said, uh-uh, that's not one. No, he takes the next one and the next one. Eventually he's got it, he opens and said, oh, I think you need to replace the washer. And that's exactly with what we do today because I find even with public transport planning, it's like, we, you know, it's like in, in, in maths in school, you had like manipulation of the formula. It's like now you've got to reverse things and work backwards. And now you appreciate, you know, maths and fractions and all these things. And, and as I said, it's like really comes into being. So, so from that perspective, I want to say, even if you got your, prof even if you professionally registered, doesn't mean you arrived. Uh, you know, many of us, we, we get the qualification, you go to EXA, you go through the registration, and once I'm PR, it's like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> that's where your journey really starts, right? And so I think that's very important to understand. So when it comes back to the principles of public transport planning, I think that, you know, one of the most important things right now, I think in all cities around our, our, our country, is that it's a lack of data. Um, and data is so important. I mean, like even in our city, the last time that we actually did proper surveys for the public transport industry was in 2004 and we called it the current public transport records and then in 2012 we tried to do it again and because the area has grown and it became so difficult we really didn't get it right and so i think that uh, and so we've been struggling along and you know doing like surveys when a development comes on board and somebody's doing a TIA a traffic impact assessment we'll ask them okay you know there's a public transport service there or facility then survey it and come back and I find that the the number one thing is about data we got to get good data and so if you got no good data then I think as professionals even as engineers you know we got all these fancy cars and we don't like to go to site and I believe that you've got to go to site because when you get to site in the mornings in your peak hour, just by observations, you can see so much of things that you will never pick up in a survey. You'll never pick up like doing a desktop. You can just go in the mornings and during the peak hour stand or drive around and you see how the behavior is and you go throughout the day at different periods, different times and you pick up so much. Uh, in terms of operations, where they're parking, why they're parking, why they're doing what they do. And I think that site observations are very important. So I think, as I'm saying to you, so the principles are data is very important, but if, and, and, and surveys are very expensive. The, 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 the other complex or sad thing about collecting data with public transport is cities that are implementing the BRT system, you find there's a lot of resistance from the public transport operators to allow for surveys to be done because they feel like it's got something to do with the BRT system and they, you know, like you're taking away their business. And so that becomes very, very challenging. So that's why I would like, love to say that, okay, if you haven't got the data, you can quickly get to site, do site observation, begin to understand what goes on and then be able to come back and then you analyze your data. And then I think even when you when you kind of analyze that you found the problem and how do you do go about solving it again, you got to supplement it with site visits. You got to go physically and see, you know, where are they loading, where are they offloading, where are they stopping, where are they parking, and it gives you such a fantastic view. We've made lots of uh, mess ups in in the in our city. We find that we thought we should put a rank here outside a shopping center, but nine out of ten times we missed the mark because they don't want to be there. You'll find the taxi ranks empty, but they want to be closer to the entrances and the like. And then we think that public transport is a menace. Okay, so that's super interesting of what you were saying and almost your message has been echoed in our previous episodes where people are always saying you cannot plan something you don't know. You have yeah. to either go on that journey, you have to go out and see what is physically happening in order for you to appreciate what you're trying to solve. So you've sort of outlined that there are some challenges that come with public transport planning with your data and that, but what are the main pitfalls that you feel that your young engineers and your team make, um, or you know even other professional engineers that switch over into public transport planning? What what are those pitfalls? Um, I think, as I said to you, that I think it's a lack of knowledge and understanding. 
um, I think that, you know, we also seem to, even before tackling the problem, we, we kind of, we fear public transport operators, right? Let's just be honest about it. Um, I think, you know, like the normal formal uh, public transport regulated service, quite happy with that. But when it comes to the informal sector, more like your paratransit systems, I think there's a lot of fear. We feel like, uh, yes, it's a, it's a very volatile industry. Uh, you know, it's a dynamic industry. And I think there's a fear that we have. But I promise you that I've spent lots of time, you know, with the public transport operators and owners and associations. I mean, they are the most incredible, fantastic individuals. Um, you know, we went away to Jackensburg to plan. I mean, there's just such a bunch of like, uh, jovial, exciting people. And, and I think like, you know, with any one of us, I mean, obviously, like if you're trying to change the system, there's always a fear from them as well. And so I think that both of us seem to have a fear. But I think when we come together in collaboration, when we begin to talk and when we begin to open and we begin to get into each other's space and like we almost empathize with each other, then I think that it makes such a massive difference. And so for, for I think the first thing is that we got to get out of this fear. We got to get out of this, you know, that it's them and us mm -hmm. and begin to see ourselves as one. And when we begin to do that, because stakeholder engagement becomes very, very important. And then I'm going to say as well, as I said to you, I, I keep punching, pushing the point that you have not arrived. And there's no textbooks like will give you all the answers. You know, it's like you've got to use your engineering judgment because otherwise then we don't need engineers. We don't need technologists and technicians. We can just go and have robots. You know, it's like mm. checklist and do this. But really you are paid to solve problems. You are paid to see like, you know, um, I think the bigger the problem, the bigger your salary that you actually get. So I, I come back, I think it's really about uh, involving yourself, understanding the business, and then really like, you know, using what you learned and to actually solve it from that particular manner. And I think there's so much of creative ways um, in terms of coming up with a system. And, and many times, you know, we need to start thinking outside the box. And I love it like, you know, when I think about when I came in the profession and I should attend the SATC, uh, the South African Transport Conference, and they used to have a, um, um, a cow train, like a replica, like out there in the foyer. And everybody used to talk about this cow train. And then we used to, from Durban, live in Santon, and it was so congested. And we used to like uh, uh, wonder, like, how are they going to actually do this? But there were some bold, bold steps that uh, that uh, Mr. Jack van der Marwe took. I mean, look at cow train today. But if you go back and see like how they did it, they were like not scared to go underground and and above and put all these wonderful infrastructure yes it's world class yes it's done that but that's really what we got to do start thinking outside the box stop going with the same old same old conventional designs but start to look differently and how that you you bring dignity to the operator you bring dignity to the commuter and i think that you know you bring dignity to the client or the or the government whoever it is up today sure robin you inspire me here <laughs> I just, you know, you've spoken about your journey of the 13 years and you pretty much are some of the brains behind the IRPTN uh, within Etikwini. So I'm going to definitely ask this question. And what are some of the interesting projects that you've been involved in that you've literally planned out and now they are obviously happening within your city? Well, I'm excited because, you know, um, I always like wanted to leave the municipal environment. And how I ended up here was I, I had a bursary. I had a bursary from the municipality in Peter Marisburg. And uh, so I grew there and I came to Durban. And again, like throughout my studies, I always had a, a bursary from the municipality. So uh, next year, I celebrate 25 years with this integrated municipality. So giving Incredible. away my age. But yeah, it's been a fantastic journey. And so my very first project here in Durban when I came was actually Ushaka. I know you know Ushaka Marine. Um, and, you know, we worked on that. And then the next thing I know that we had the World Cup. So initially we lost the World Cup in 2006. I don't know if you remember the bid. But then at that stage, we were already preparing, you know, for um, to, to host the World Cup. And we got it in 2010. But then thereafter, we noticed, like, I got involved with the uh, stadiums, uh, the Moza Mabida, and the training venues in, in uh, King Goodwill's Velatini in Amlazi. Um, uh, Princess Mogogo in, uh, in uh, Kwamashu and uh, Sugar Ray Kulu in uh, Claremont. And this was so good because we were involved with the stadium, the design of the transport infrastructure, which also included uh, public transport. And I think that when we ran the 2010 World Cup, uh, we had a fantastic system of park and ride. 
So what happened was we used all the uh, shopping centers like Pavilion, Gateway, uh, Galleria shopping center in the south. So we had uh, Gateway in the north, we had um, Pavilion in the west, and we had um, Galleria in the south. So you can see there. So we operated a, a park and ride system. And what was so good, we used the minibus taxis. This was 2010, the same taxi, the paratransit system. And I promise you, they worked like a bomb. It was absolutely efficient. I would drive uh, to the, the shopping center, get onto a, a vehicle. They bring you right into the CBD and we walk to watch the World Cup. But that gave birth to something that was exciting. And I must give him credit. There's two gentlemen. Uh, one is Mr. Logan Moodley and the other Mr. Eric Muller. Um, basically, they, um, in one afternoon or whatever they were telling me, is that they developed the people mover system. So in Durban, we've got right now the people mover system. I don't know if you've come here. It's like an inner city shuttle service, got three routes and you can interchange and you can visit the entire city. So that was birthed out of um, the World Cup. And that's now 11 years still running. And uh, yeah, it's, it's like been fantastic. And then again, we got involved with the development of the King Shaka International Airport in 2010, uh, together with the Dubai Trade Port. And uh, because, you know, we became a, um, a municipality, the, the Etibani municipality, previous to this, Durban was made up of five smaller municipalities. Uh, we call it the erstwhile uh, entities, like for example, the North, um, inner west, outer west, uh, the south, and the, and the central. And so it was also about bringing them together, but none of them had uh, transport specialists. And, uh, and this is where I got my professional registration as engineer. I was responsible for developing the public, I mean, a, a transport plan for Mshlanga, for that node, as well as for uh, the Hillcrest areas. So those were the fantastic projects. And then, as I said to you, uh, in 2008, I uh, was appointed and we had to develop the uh, wall to wall public transport plan for the city, which obviously gave birth to this whole integrated rapid public transport network. And I promise you that was an amazing, amazing project. Um, we first developed the wall to wall plan and then out of the plan, we had to implement the first um, sort of phase of it. Other cities went with one trunk corridor. We went with a big bang approach. Uh, we had four corridors that we went out and one of them was the rail based corridor, which is the C2. And so we went out to that and I promised you it was an amazing, amazing journey um, <laughs> to an extent where after we finished the project in 2013, we did not want to look at Debenez Pizza because <laughs> <laughs> every Thursday we would meet um, and it's your company, by the way, it was uh, that was part of our team. And every Thursday, you know, um, it was from eight o'clock to about one or two o'clock, we would sit together, strategize, come up the program. And so what is so good is that, I mean, you know, um, planning gives birth to all the infrastructure projects. It all starts in the planning uh, arena, whether it's transportation planning, whether it's public transport planning. So planning, you know, it starts there. And as I said that, you know, my branch gave birth to the IPTN system. Now it's ginormous. It's a 20 billion rand uh, a system that's being implemented, but from a little small branch called public transport planning, Mm -hmm. The municipality gave birth to such a ginormous project. But, I, but you know, I want to just leave this thought as well. I want to say that planning, if you want to come into the planning arena, it is not a sprint. Mm -hmm. It's a marathon. Um, and, and secondly, I would also say this, that planning seems to also be a calling. Um, you know, it demands a lot of working together in a team. Uh, it demands a lot of patience because you don't see what you plan happen immediately. And as I said to you, we've, uh, the wall to wall public transport plan in the city of Durban was completed in 2010, right? But now it's 2021. We, our first corridor is not gone live yet. It's 11 years later. So you get irritated, you get frustrated, but as planners, you know you've got patience and, and I think that's very important. So really, you know, if you want to come into the planning uh, arena, I think you've got to think about it. Do I have the patience? Um, you know, it, it, I know it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. I can plan today. It can take five years, 10 years, 15 years to be implemented. So are you willing to do that? So Aiden, I can go on and on, but I, I think we've got time. So I'm going to stop there and then you can jump in as well. Robert, thank you. I think you've left us with a lot of food for thoughts, especially about how 
engineering is not just about you know on the ground infrastructure but it's the plans that sits backing up all that infrastructure as well as how it's so important to collaborate you know with the people that you might be afraid of um, as well as the people that you like working with so I just want to say thank you again uh, this has been incredible and uh if you haven't inspired anybody else, you've inspired me, and I definitely think this is a, an arena that I'd like to, you know, come to war in. Uh, so, Robin, thank you for your time. Yeah, and what's a quick uh, story, right? Maybe yes. leave, uh, a little story which I developed my own sort of leadership principle out of it very quickly, right? So, when I come out of my driveway, um, mm -hmm. I always notice my neighbor's dog will run after my car and bark. Now, there's a little bit of an incline. And so I just never bothered about it because I just get out of my driveway and I'm driving up the road. Oh. Oh gosh, it seems that we have lost Robin, uh, but I will ensure that we do get the story that he was going to tell us. But thank you so much for joining us for this episode and we will definitely uh, do the next one shortly.